The Little Red Book, Chapter 1 The Communist Party The force at the core leading our cause forward is the Chinese Communist Party. The theoretical basis guiding our thinking is Marxism-Leninism. Opening address at the first session of the First National People's Congress of the People's Republic of China, in brackets, September 15th, 1954. If there is to be revolution, there must be a revolutionary party. Without a revolutionary party, without a party built on the Marxist-Leninist revolutionary theory and in the Marxist-Leninist revolutionary style, it is impossible to lead the working class and the broad masses of the people in defeating imperialism and its running dogs. Quote, Revolutionary forces of the world unite, fight against imperialist aggression, exclamation mark, end quote. In brackets, November 1948. Selected Works, Volume 4, page 284. Without the efforts of the Chinese Communist Party, without the Chinese Communists, as the mainstay of the Chinese people, China can never achieve independence and liberation, or industrialization and the modernization of her agriculture. On Coalition Government in brackets, April 24th, 1945. Selected Works, Volume 3, page 318. The Chinese Communist Party is the core of leadership of the whole Chinese people. Without this core, the cause of socialism cannot be victorious. Talk at the general reception for the delegates to the Third National Congress of the New Democratic Youth League of China, in brackets May 25th, 1957. A well-disciplined party armed with the theory of Marxism-Leninism, using the method of self-criticism and linked with the masses of the people, an army under the leadership of such a party, a united front of all revolutionary classes and all revolutionary groups under the leadership of such a party, these are the three main weapons with which we have defeated the enemy. Quote, on the People's Democratic Dictatorship, in brackets, June 30th, 1949, Selected Works, Volume 4, page 422. We must have faith in the masses and we must have faith in the party. These are two cardinal principles. If we doubt these principles, we shall accomplish nothing. On the question of agricultural cooperation, in brackets July 31st, 1955, third edition, page 7. Armed with Marxist-Leninist theory and ideology, the Communist Party of China has brought a new style of work to the Chinese people a style of work which essentially entails integrating theory with practice, forging close links with the masses and practicing self-criticism. Quote, on coalition government, in brackets, April 24th, 1945, Selected Works, Volume 3, page 314. No political party can possibly lead a great revolutionary movement to victory unless it possesses revolutionary theory and a knowledge of history and has a profound grasp of the practical movement. Quote, the role of the Chinese Communist Party in the National War, in brackets October 1938, Selected Works, Volume 2, page 208. As we used to say... The rectification movement is, quote, a widespread movement of Marxist education, end quote. Rectification means the whole party studying Marxism through criticism and self-criticism. We can certainly learn more about Marxism in the course of the rectification movement. 
Speech at the Chinese Communist Party's National Conference on Propaganda Work, in brackets, March 12th, 1957. First Pocket, Edition, page 14. It is an arduous task to ensure a better life for the several hundred million people of China and to build our economically and culturally backward country into a prosperous and powerful one with a high level of culture. And it is precisely in order to be able to shoulder this task more competently and work better together with all non-party people who are actuated by high ideals and determined to institute reforms that we must conduct rectification movements both now and in the future, and constantly rid ourselves of whatever is wrong. I bid, page 15. Policy is the starting point of all the practical actions of a revolutionary party and manifests itself in the process and the end result of that party's actions. A revolutionary party is carrying out a policy whenever it takes any action. If it is not carrying out a correct policy, it is carrying out a wrong policy. If it is not carrying out a given policy consciously, it is doing so blindly. What we call experience is the process and the end result of carrying out a policy. Only through the practice of the people, that is, through experience, can we verify whether a policy is correct or wrong and determine to what extent it is correct or wrong. But people's practice, especially the practice of a revolutionary party and the revolutionary masses, cannot but be bound up with one policy or another. Therefore, before any action is taken, we must explain the policy, which we have formulated in the light of the given circumstances, to party members and to the masses. Otherwise, party members and the masses will depart from the guidance of our policy, act blindly, and carry out a wrong policy. Quote, on the policy concerning industry and commerce, end quote, in brackets, February 27th, 1948, Selected Works, Volume 4, pages 204 to 205. Our party has laid down the general line and general policy of the Chinese Revolution, as well as various specific lines for work and specific policies. However, while many comrades remember our party's specific lines for work and specific policies, they often forget its general line and general policy. If we actually forget the party's general line and general policy, then we shall be blind, half-baked, muddle-headed revolutionaries, and when we carry out a specific line for work and a specific policy, we shall lose our bearings and vacillate now to the left and now to the right, and the work will suffer. Quote, Speech at a conference of cadres in the Shanxi Shui Yuan Liberated Area. End quote. Brackets, April first, nineteen forty-eight. Selected works, volume four, page two hundred and thirty-eight. Policy and tactics are the life of the party. Leading comrades at all levels must give them full attention and must never, on any account, be negligent. Quote, a circular on the situation, in brackets, March 20th, 1948, Selected Works, Volume 4, page 220. This has been the end of Chapter 1 of The Little Red Book, The Communist Party. Chapter 2 of The Little Red Book by Mao Zedong Classes and Class Struggle Classes struggle, some classes triumph, others are eliminated. Such is history, such is the history of civilization for thousands of years. To interpret history from this viewpoint is historical materialism. Standing in opposition to this viewpoint is historical idealism. 
Quote, Castaway Illusions Prepare for Struggle, in brackets, August 14th, 1949, Selected Works, Volume 4, page 428. In class, society, everyone lives as a member of a particular class, and every kind of thinking, without exception, is stamped with the brand of a class. Quote, on practice, in brackets, July 1937, Selected Works, Volume 1, page 296. Changes in society are due chiefly to the development of the internal contradictions in society, that is, the contradiction between the productive forces and the relations of production, the contradiction between classes and the contradiction between the old and the new. It is the development of these contradictions that pushes society forward and gives the impetus for the supersession of the old society by the new. Quote, on Contradiction, in brackets, August 1937, Selected Works, Volume 1, page 314. The ruthless economic exploitation and political oppression of the peasants by the landlord class forced them into numerous uprisings against its rule. It was the class struggles of the peasants, the peasant uprisings and peasant wars that constituted the real motive, force, of historical development in Chinese feudal society. Quote, the Chinese Revolution and the Chinese Communist Party in brackets, December 1929, Selected Works, Volume 2, page 308. In the final analysis, national struggle is a matter of class struggle. Among the whites in the United States, it is only the reactionary ruling circles who oppress the black people. They can in no way represent the workers, farmers, revolutionary intellectuals, and other enlightened persons who comprise the overwhelming majority of the white people. Quote, Statement supporting the American Negroes in their just struggle against racial discrimination by U.S. imperialism. End quote. In brackets, August 8th, 1963. People of the world unite and defeat the U.S. aggressors and all their lackeys. Second edition, pages three to four. It is up to us to organize the people. As for the reactionaries in China, it is up to us to organize the people to overthrow them. Everything reactionary is the same. If you don't hit it, it won't fall. This is also like sweeping the floor. As a rule, where the broom does not reach, the dust will not vanish of itself. Quote, the situation and our policy after the victory in the War of Resistance against Japan. In brackets, August 13th, 1945. Selected Works, Volume 4, page 19. The enemy will not perish of himself. Neither the Chinese reactionaries nor the aggressive forces of U.S. imperialism in China will step down from the stage of history of their own accord. Quote, Carry the revolution through to the end. In brackets, December 30th, 1948. Selected Works, Volume 4, page 301. A revolution is not a dinner party, or writing an essay, or painting a picture, or doing embroidery. It cannot be so refined, so leisurely, and gentle, so temperate, kind, courteous, restrained, and magnanimous. A revolution is an insurrection, an act of violence by which one class overthrows another. Quote, report on an investigation of the peasant movement in Hunan, in brackets 1927 March. Selected Works, Volume 1, page 28. Chiang Kai-shek always tries to wrest every ounce of power and every ounce of gain from the people, and we, our policy is to give him tit-for-tat and to fight for every inch of land. We act after his fashion. He always tries to impose war on the people, one sword in his left hand and another in his right. We take up swords too, following his example, as Chiang Kai-shek is now sharpening his swords, we must sharpen ours, too. 
Quote, the situation and our policy after the victory in the War of Resistance against Japan. In brackets, August 13th, 1945. Selected Works, Volume 4, pages 14 to 15. Who are our enemies? Who are our friends? This is a question of the first importance for the revolution, the basic reason why all previous revolutionary struggles in China achieved so little was their failure to unite with real friends in order to attack real enemies. A revolutionary party is the guide of the masses, and no revolution ever succeeds when the revolutionary party leads them astray. To ensure that we will definitely achieve success in our revolution and will not lead the masses astray, we must pay attention to uniting with our real friends in order to attack our real enemies. To distinguish real friends from real enemies, we must make a general analysis of the economic status of the various classes in Chinese society and of their respective attitudes toward the revolution. Quote, analysis of the classes in Chinese society, in brackets, March 1926, Selected Works, Volume 1, page 13. Our enemies are all those in league with imperialism, the warlords, the bureaucrats, the comprador class, the big landlord class, and the reactionary section of the intelligentsia attached to them. The leading force in our revolution is the industrial proletariat. Our closest friends are the entire semi-proletariat and petty bourgeoisie. As for the vacillating middle bourgeoisie, their right wing may become our enemy and their left wing may become our friend. But we must be constantly on our guard and not let them create confusion within our ranks. I bid page 19. Whoever sides with the revolutionary people is a revolutionary. Whoever sides with imperialism, feudalism, and bureaucrat capitalism is a counter-revolutionary. Whoever sides with the revolutionary people in words only, but acts otherwise, is a revolutionary in speech. Whoever sides with the revolutionary people in deed, as well as in word, is a revolutionary in the full sense. Closing speech at the second session of the First National Committee of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, in brackets, June 23, 1950. I hold that it is bad, as far as we are concerned, if a person, a political party, an army or a school, is not attacked by the enemy, for in that case it would definitely mean that we have sunk to the level of the enemy. It is good if we are attacked by the enemy, since it proves that we have drawn a clear line of demarcation between the enemy and ourselves. It is still better if the enemy attacks us wildly and paints us as utterly black and without a single virtue. It demonstrates that we have not only drawn a clear line of demarcation between the enemy and ourselves, but achieved a great deal in our work. To be attacked by the enemy is not a bad thing, but a good thing. In brackets, May 26th, 1939. First Pocket Edition, page 2. We should support whatever the enemy opposes, and oppose whatever the enemy supports. Quote, interview with three correspondents from the Central News Agency, the Sao Tang Pao, and the Xin Min Pao, in brackets, September 16th, 1939, Selected Works, Volume 2, page 272. Our stand is that of the proletariat and of the masses. For members of the Communist Party, this means keeping to the stand of the party, keeping to party spirit and party policy. Quote, Talks at the Yen'an Forum on Literature and Art, in brackets May 1942. Selected Works, Volume 3, page 70. After the enemies with guns have been wiped out, there will still be enemies without guns. They are bound to struggle desperately against us, and we must never regard these enemies lightly. If we do not now raise and understand the problem in this way, we shall commit the gravest mistakes. Quote, Report to the second plenary session of the 7th Central Committee of the Communist Party of China. 
in brackets, March 5th, 1949. Selected Works, Volume 4, page 307. The imperialists and domestic reactionaries will certainly not take their defeat lying down, and they will struggle to the last ditch. After there is peace and order throughout the country, they will still engage in sabotage and create disturbances in various ways and will try every day and every minute to stage a comeback. This is inevitable and beyond all doubt, and no circumstances are there under which we ought relax our vigilance. Opening address at the first plenary session of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, in brackets, September 21st, 1949. In China, although in the main socialist transformation has been completed with respect to the system of ownership, and although the large-scale and turbulent class struggles of the masses characteristic of the previous revolutionary periods have in the main come to an end. There are still remnants of the overthrown landlord and comprador classes, there is still a bourgeoisie, and the remoulding of the petty bourgeoisie has only just started. The class struggle is by no means over. The class struggle between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, the class struggle between the different political forces, and the class struggle in the ideological held between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, will continue to be long and torturous, and at times will even become very acute. The proletariat seeks to transform the world according to its own world outlook and so does the bourgeoisie. In this respect, the question of which will win out, socialism or capitalism, is still not really settled. On the correct handling of contradictions among the people, in brackets, February 27th, 1957, first pocket edition, pages 51 to 52. It will take a fairly long period of time to decide the issue in the ideological struggle between socialism and capitalism in our country. The reason is that the influence of the bourgeoisie and of the intellectuals who come from the old society will remain in our country for a long time to come. And so will their class ideology. If this is not sufficiently understood, or is not understood at all, the gravest mistakes will be made, and the necessity of waging the struggle in the ideological field will be ignored. I bid, pages 52 to 53. In our country, bourgeois and petty bourgeois ideology, anti-Marxist ideology, will continue to exist for a long time. Basically, the socialist system has been established in our country. We have won the basic victory in transforming the ownership of the means of production, but we have not yet won complete victory on the political and ideological fronts. In the ideological field, the question of who will win in the struggle between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie has not been really settled yet. We still have to wage a protracted struggle against bourgeois and petty bourgeois ideology. It is wrong not to understand this and to give up ideological struggle. All erroneous ideas, all poisonous weeds, all ghosts and monsters must be subjected to criticism. In no circumstance should they be allowed to spread unchecked. However, the criticism should be fully reasoned, analytical and convincing and not rough, bureaucratic, metaphysical, or dogmatic. Speech at the Chinese Communist Party's National Conference on Propaganda Work, in brackets, March 12, 1957, First Pocket Edition, pages 26 to 27. Both dogmatism and revisionism run counter to Marxism. Marxism must certainly advance. It must develop along with the development of practice and cannot stand still. It would become lifeless if it remained stagnant and stereotyped. However, the basic principles of Marxism must never be violated, or otherwise mistakes will be made. 
It is dogmatism to approach Marxism from a metaphysical point of view and to regard it as something rigid. It is revisionism to negate the basic principles of Marxism and to negate its universal truth. Revisionism is one form of bourgeois ideology. The revisionists deny the differences between socialism and capitalism, between the dictatorship of the proletariat and the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. What they advocate is, in fact, not the socialist line, but the capitalist line. In present circumstances, revisionism is more pernicious than dogmatism. One of our current important tasks on the ideological front is to unfold criticism of revisionism. Ibid, pages 27 to 28. Revisionism, or right opportunism, is a bourgeois trend of thought that is even more dangerous than dogmatism. The revisionists, the right opportunists, pay lip service to Marxism. They too attack, quote, dogmatism. But what they are really attacking is the quintessence of Marxism. They oppose or distort materialism and dialectics, oppose or try to weaken the people's democratic dictatorship and the leading role of the Communist Party, and oppose or try to weaken socialist transformation and socialist construction. After the basic victory of the socialist revolution in our country, there are still a number of people who vainly hope to restore the capitalist system and fight the working class on every front, including the ideological one, and their right-hand men in this struggle are the revisionists. On the correct handling of contradictions among the people, in brackets February 27th, 1957, first pocket edition, pages 56 to 57. This has been the end of chapter 2 of The Little Red Book by Mao Zedong, Classes and Class Struggle. The Little Red Book by Mao Zedong Chapter 3 Socialism and Communism Communism is at once a complete system of proletarian ideology and a new social system. It is different from any other ideological and social system and is the most complete, progressive, revolutionary and rational system in human history. The ideological and social system of feudalism has a place only in the museum of history. The ideological and social system of capitalism has also become a museum piece in one part of the world, in brackets, in the Soviet Union. While in other countries it resembles, quote, a dying person who is sinking fast like the sun setting beyond the western hills, end quote and will soon be relegated to the museum. The communist ideological and social system alone is full of youth and vitality. Sweeping the world with the momentum of an avalanche and the force of a thunderbolt. Quote, on New Democracy, in brackets, January 1940, Selected Works, Volume 2, pages 360-61. The socialist system will eventually replace the capitalist system. This is an objective law independent of man's will. However much the reactionaries try to hold back the wheel of history, sooner or later revolution will take place and will inevitably triumph. Quote, Speech at the meeting of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR in celebration of the 40th anniversary of the Great October Socialist Revolution. In brackets, November 6th, 1957. We communists never conceal our political views. Definitely and beyond all doubt, our future, or maximum program, is to carry China forward to socialism and communism. Both the name of our party and our Marxist world outlook unequivocally point to this supreme ideal of the future, a future of incomparable brightness, and splendor. Quote, on coalition government, in brackets, April 24th, 1945, Selected Works, Volume 3, page 282. 
Taken as a whole, the Chinese revolutionary movement led by the Communist Party embraces the two stages, i.e. the democratic and the socialist revolutions, which are two essentially different revolutionary processes. And the second process can be carried through only after the first has been completed. The democratic revolution is the necessary preparation for the socialist revolution, and the socialist revolution is the inevitable sequel to the democratic revolution. The ultimate aim for which all communists strive is to bring about a socialist and communist society. Quote, the Chinese Revolution and the Chinese Communist Party, in brackets, December 1939. Selected Works, Volume 2, pages 330 to 31. Socialist Revolution aims at liberating the productive forces. The changeover from individual to socialist, collective ownership in agriculture and handicrafts, and from capitalist to socialist ownership in private industry and commerce, is bound to bring about a tremendous liberation of the productive forces. Thus, the social conditions are being created for a tremendous expansion of industrial and agricultural production. Speech at the Supreme State Conference, in brackets, January 25th, 1956. We are now carrying out a revolution not only in the social system, the change from private to public ownership, but also in technology, the change from handicraft to large-scale modern machine production, and the two revolutions are interconnected. In agriculture, with conditions as they are in our country, cooperation must precede the use of big machinery. In brackets, in capitalist countries, agriculture develops in a capitalist way. End brackets. Therefore, we must on no account regard industry and agriculture, socialist industrialization, and the socialist transformation of agriculture as two separate and isolated things, and on no account must we emphasize the one and play down the other. On the question of agricultural cooperation, in brackets, July 51st, 1955, 3rd edition, pages 19 to 20. The new social system has only just been established and requires time for its consolidation. It must not be assumed that the new system can be completely consolidated the moment it is established, for that is impossible. It has to be consolidated step by step. To achieve its ultimate consolidation, it is necessary not only to bring about the socialist industrialization of the country, and persevere in the socialist revolution on the economic front, but to carry on constant and arduous socialist revolutionary struggles and socialist education on the political and ideological fronts. Moreover, various contributory international factors are required. Speech at the Chinese Communist Party's National Conference on Propaganda Work in brackets March 12th, 1957. First Pocket Edition, page 2. In China, the struggle to consolidate the socialist system, the struggle to decide whether socialism or capitalism will prevail, will still take a long historical period. But we should all realize that the new system of socialism will unquestionably be consolidated. We can assuredly build a socialist state with modern industry, modern agriculture, and modern science and culture. The number of intellectuals who are hostile to our state is very small. They do not like our state, i.e. the dictatorship of the proletariat, and yearn for the old society. Whenever there is an opportunity, they will stir up trouble and attempt to overthrow the Communist Party and restore the old China. As between the proletarian and the bourgeois roads, as between the socialist and the capitalist roads, these people stubbornly choose to follow the latter. 
In fact, this road is impossible, and in fact, therefore, they are ready to capitulate to imperialism, feudalism, and bureaucrat capitalism. Such people are to be found in political circles and in industrial and commercial, cultural and educational, scientific and technological, and religious circles, and they are extremely reactionary. I bid pages three to four. The serious problem is the education of the peasantry. The peasant economy is scattered, and the socialization of agriculture, judging by the Soviet Union's experience, will require a long time and painstaking work. Without socialization of agriculture, there can be no complete, consolidated socialism. Quote, On the People's Democratic Dictatorship June 30th, 1949. Selected Works, Volume 4, page 419. We must have faith, first, that the peasant masses are ready to advance step by step along the road of socialism under the leadership of the party, and second, that the party is capable of leading the peasants along this road. These two points are the essence of the matter, the main current. On the question of agricultural cooperation, in brackets, July 31st, 1955, 3rd edition, page 18. The leading bodies in cooperatives must establish the dominant position of the poor peasants and the new lower middle peasants in these bodies, with the old lower middle peasants and the upper middle peasants, whether old or new, as the supplementary force. Only thus can unity between the poor and middle peasants be attained, the cooperatives be consolidated, production be expanded, and the socialist transformation of the entire countryside be correctly accomplished in accordance with the party's policy. Otherwise, unity between the middle and poor peasants cannot be attained, the cooperatives cannot be consolidated, production cannot be expanded, and the socialist transformation of the entire countryside cannot be achieved. Introductory note to, quote, How control of the Wu-Tang cooperative shifted from the middle to the poor peasants, end quote, in brackets 1955. The socialist upsurge in China's countryside. Chinese Ed, Volume 2. It is essential to unite with the middle peasants, and it is wrong not to do so. But on whom must the working class and the Communist Party rely in the countryside in order to unite with the middle peasants and realize the socialist transformation of the entire countryside? Surely on none other than the poor peasants. That was the case when the struggle against the landlords was being waged and the land reform was being carried out, and that is the case today when the struggle against the rich peasants and other capitalist elements is being waged to achieve the socialist transformation of agriculture. In both these revolutionary periods, the middle peasants wavered in the initial stages. It is only after they clearly see the general trend of events and the approaching triumph of the revolution that the middle peasants will come in on the side of the revolution. The poor peasants must work on the middle peasants and win them over, so that the revolution will broaden from day to day until final victory. Introductory note to, quote, the lesson of the middle peasant cooperative and the Poor Peasant Cooperative in Fuan County, in brackets 1955. The Socialist Upsurge in China's Countryside, Chinese Edition, Volume 2. There is a serious tendency towards capitalism among the well-to-do peasants. This tendency will become rampant if we, in the slightest way, neglect political work among the peasants during the cooperative movement and for a very long period after. Introductory note to, quote, a resolute struggle must be waged against the tendency towards capitalism, in brackets 1955, the socialist upsurge in China's countryside, Chinese edition, volume 1. The agricultural cooperative movement has been a severe ideological and political struggle from the very beginning. 
no cooperative can be established without going through such a struggle. Before a brand new social system can be built on the site of the old, the site must be swept clean. Invariably, remnants of old ideas reflecting the old system remain in people's minds for a long time, and they do not easily give way. After a cooperative is established, it must go through many more struggles before it can be consolidated. Even then, the moment it relaxes its efforts, it may collapse. Introductory note to, quote, A Serious Lesson, 1955. The Socialist Upsurge in China's Countryside, Chinese Edition, Volume 1. The spontaneous forces of capitalism have been steadily growing in the countryside in recent years, with new rich peasants springing up everywhere and many well-to-do middle peasants striving to become rich peasants. On the other hand, many poor peasants are still living in poverty for lack of sufficient means of production, with some in debt and others selling or renting out their land. If this tendency goes unchecked, the polarization in the countryside will inevitably be aggravated day by day. Those peasants who lose their land and those who remain in poverty will complain that we are doing nothing to save them from ruin or to help them overcome their difficulties. Nor will the well-to-do middle peasants who are heading in the capitalist direction be pleased with us, for we shall never be able to satisfy their demands unless we intend to take the capitalist road. Can the worker-peasant alliance continue to stand in these circumstances? Obviously not. There is no solution to this problem except on a new basis, and that means to bring about, step by step, the socialist transformation of the whole of agriculture simultaneously with the gradual realization of socialist industrialization and the socialist transformation of handicrafts and capitalist industry and commerce. In other words, it means to carry out cooperation and eliminate the rich peasant economy and the individual economy in the countryside, so that all the rural people will become increasingly well-off together. We maintain that this is the only way to consolidate the worker-peasant alliance. On the question of agricultural cooperation, in brackets July 31st, 1955, third edition, pages 26 to 27. By overall planning, we mean planning which takes into consideration the interests of the 600 million people of our country. In drawing up plans, handling affairs, or thinking over problems, we must proceed from the fact that China has a population of 600 million people, and we must never forget this fact. On the correct handling of contradictions among the people, in brackets February 27th, 1957, first pocket edition, page 47. In addition to the leadership of the party, a decisive factor in our population of 600 million. More people means a greater ferment of ideas, more enthusiasm and more energy. Never before have the masses of the people been so inspired, so militant, and so daring as at present. Introducing a cooperative, in brackets, April 15th, 1958. Apart from their other characteristics, the outstanding thing about China's 600 million people is that they are, quote, poor and blank. This may seem a bad thing, but in reality it is a good thing. Poverty gives rise to the desire for change, the desire for action, and the desire for revolution. On a blank sheet of paper, free from any mark, the freshest and most beautiful characters can be written, the freshest and most beautiful pictures can be painted. After the countrywide victory of the Chinese Revolution and the solution of the land problem, Two basic contradictions still exist in China. The first is internal, that is, the contradiction between the working class and the bourgeoisie. The second is external, that is, the contradiction between China and the imperialist countries. Consequently, after the victory of the People's Democratic Revolution, the state power of the People's Republic under the leadership of the working class 
must not be weakened, but, but must be strengthened. Quote, Report to the Second Plenary Session of the Seventh Central Committee of the Communist Party of China. In brackets, March 5th, 1949. Selected Works, Volume 4, page 369. Quote, Don't you want to abolish state power? End quote. Yes, we do, but not right now. We cannot do it yet. Why? Because imperialism still exists. Because domestic reaction still exists. Because classes still exist in our country. Our present task is to strengthen the people's state apparatus. Mainly, the people's army, the people's police, and the people's courts, in order to consolidate national defense and protect the people's interests. Quote, on the People's Democratic Dictatorship, in brackets June 30th, 1949, Selected Works, Volume 4, page 418. Our state is a people's democratic dictatorship, led by the working class and based on the worker-peasant alliance. What is this dictatorship for? Its first function is to suppress the reactionary classes and elements and those exploiters in our country who resist the socialist revolution, to suppress those who try to wreck our socialist construction, or in other words, to resolve the internal contradictions between ourselves and the enemy. For instance, to arrest, try and sentence certain counter-revolutionaries, and to deprive landlords and bureaucrat capitalists of their right to vote and their freedom of speech for a specified period of time, all this comes within the scope of our dictatorship. To maintain public order and safeguard the interests of the people, it is likewise necessary to exercise dictatorship over embezzlers, swindlers, arsonists, murderers, criminal gangs, and other scandals who seriously disrupt public order. The second function of this dictatorship is to protect our country from subversion and possible aggression by external enemies. In that event, it is the task of this dictatorship to resolve the external contradiction between ourselves and the enemy. The aim of this dictatorship is to protect all our people so that they can devote themselves to peaceful labor and build China into a socialist country with a modern industry, agriculture, science, and culture. On the correct handling of contradictions among the people, in brackets February 27th, 1957, First Pocket Edition, pages 6 to 7. The People's Democratic Dictatorship needs the leadership of the working class, for it is only the working class that is most far sighted, most selfless, and most thoroughly revolutionary. The entire history of revolution proves that without the leadership of the working class, revolution fails, and that with the leadership of the working class, revolution triumphs. Quote, on the People's Democratic Dictatorship, in brackets June 30th, 1949, Selected Works, Volume 4, page 421. The People's Democratic Dictatorship is based on the alliance of the working class, the peasantry, and the urban petty bourgeoisie, and mainly on the alliance of the workers and the peasants, because these two classes comprise 80 or so percent of China's population. These two classes are the main force in overthrowing imperialism and the Kuomintang reactionaries. The transition from new democracy to socialism also depends mainly upon their alliance. From IBID Class struggle, the struggle for production and scientific experiment, are the three great revolutionary movements for building a mighty socialist country. These movements are a sure guarantee that communists will be free from bureaucracy and immune against revisionism and dogmatism and will forever remain invincible. They are a reliable guarantee that the proletariat will be able to unite with the broad working masses and realize a democratic dictatorship. If, in the absence of these movements, the landlords, rich peasants, counter-revolutionaries, bad elements, and monsters were all allowed to crawl out, while our cadres were 
to shut their eyes to all this and in many cases fail even to differentiate between the enemy and ourselves, but were to collaborate with the enemy and were corrupted, divided and demoralized by him, if our cadres were thus pulled out, or the enemy were able to sneak in, and if many of our workers, peasants, and intellectuals were left defenseless against both the soft and hard tactics of the enemy, then it would not take long, perhaps, only several years or a decade or several decades at most, before a counter-revolutionary restoration on a national scale inevitably occurred. The Marxist-Leninist party would undoubtedly become a revisionist party or a fascist party, and the whole of China would change its color. Note on, quote, the seven well-written documents of Chekyang province concerning cadres. Participation in physical labor, end quote. In brackets, May 9th, 1963, quoted in on Khrushchev's phony communism and its historical lessons for the world. Pages 71 to 72. The People's Democratic Dictatorship uses two methods. Towards the enemy, it uses the method of dictatorship. That is, for as long a period of time as is necessary, it does not let them take part in political activities and compels them to obey the law of the people's government and to engage in labor and, through labor, transform themselves into new men. Towards the people, on the contrary, it uses the method not of compulsion but of democracy. That is, it must necessarily let them take part in political activities and does not compel them to do this or that, but uses the method of democracy in educating and persuading them. Closing speech at the second session of the First National Committee of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, in brackets, June 23, 1950. Under the leadership of the Communist Party, the Chinese people are carrying out a vigorous rectification movement in order to bring about the rapid development of socialism in China on a firmer basis. It is a movement for carrying out a nationwide debate which is both guided and free, a debate in the city and the countryside on such questions as the socialist road versus the capitalist road the basic system of the state, and its major policies, the working style of party and government functionaries, and the question of the welfare of the people, a debate which is conducted by setting forth facts and reasoning things out, so as correctly to resolve those actual contradictions among the people which demand immediate solution. This is a socialist movement for the self-education and self-remolding of the people. Quote, speech at the meeting of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR in celebration of the 40th anniversary of the Great October Socialist Revolution, in brackets November 6th, 1957. Most arduous tasks lie ahead of us in the great work of construction. Although there are over 10 million members in our party, they still constitute a very small minority of the country's population. In government departments and public organizations and enterprises, much work has to be done by non-party people. It is impossible to get this work well done unless we are good at relying on the masses and cooperating with non-party people. While continuing to strengthen the unity of the whole party, we must also continue to strengthen the unity of all our nationalities democratic classes, democratic parties, and people's organizations, and to consolidate and expand the People's Democratic United Front, and we must conscientiously get rid of every unhealthy manifestation in any link in our work that is detrimental to the unity between the party and the people. Quote, opening address at the 8th National Congress of the Communist Party of China, in brackets, September 15th, 1956. This has been the end 
of Chapter 3 of Mao Zedong's Little Red Audio Book Socialism and Communism Chapter 4 of Chairman Mao's Little Red Book The Correct Handling of Contradictions Among the People We are confronted by two types of social contradictions those between ourselves and the enemy, and those among the people themselves. The two are totally different in their nature. On the correct handling of contradictions among the people, in brackets, February 27th, 1957, first pocket edition, page 2. To understand these two different types of contradictions correctly, we must first be clear on what is meant by, quote, the people, and what is meant by, quote, the enemy. At the present stage, the period of building socialism, the classes, strata, and social groups which favor support and work for the cause of socialist construction, all come within the category of the people, while the social forces and groups which resist the socialist revolution and are hostile to or sabotage socialist construction, are all enemies of the people. I bid pages two to three. In the conditions prevailing in China today, the contradictions among the people comprise the contradictions within the working class, the contradictions within the peasantry, the contradictions within the intelligentsia, the contradictions between the working class and the peasantry, the contradictions between the workers and peasants on the one hand and the intelligentsia on the other, the contradictions between the working class and other sections of the working people on the one hand and the national bourgeoisie on the other, the contradictions within the national bourgeoisie, and so on. Our people's government is one that genuinely represents the people's interests. It is a government that serves the people. Nevertheless, there are still certain contradictions between the government and the people. These include contradictions among the interests of the state, the interests of the collective, and the interests of the individual. Between democracy and centralism, between the leadership and the led, and the contradiction arising from the bureaucratic style of work of certain government workers in their relations with the masses. All these are also contradictions among the people. Generally speaking, the people's basic identity of interests underlies the contradictions among the people. I bid pages three to four. The contradictions between ourselves and the enemy are antagonistic contradictions. Within the ranks of the people, the contradictions among the working people are non-antagonistic, while those between the exploited and the exploiting classes have a non-antagonistic aspect in addition to an antagonistic aspect. I bid page 3. In the political life of our people, how should right be distinguished from wrong in one's words and actions? On the basis of the principles of our constitution, the will of the overwhelming majority of our people, and the common political positions which have been proclaimed on various occasions by our political parties and groups, we consider that, broadly speaking, the criteria should be as follows. 1. Words and actions should help to unite and not divide the people of our various nationalities. Two. They should be beneficial and not harmful to socialist transformation and socialist construction. 3. They should help to consolidate and not undermine or weaken the people's democratic dictatorship. 4. They should help to consolidate and not undermine or weaken democratic centralism. 5. They should help to strengthen and not discard or weaken the leadership of the Communist Party. 6. They should be beneficial and not harmful to international socialist unity and the unity of the peace-loving people of the world. 
Of these six criteria, the most important are the socialist path and the leadership of the party. I bid pages 57 to 58. The question of suppressing counter-revolutionaries is one of a struggle between ourselves and the enemy, a contradiction between ourselves and the enemy. Among the people, there are some who see this question in a somewhat different light. Two kinds of persons hold views different from ours. Those with a rightist way of thinking make no distinction between ourselves and the enemy and take the enemy for our own people. They regard as friends the very persons whom the broad masses regard as enemies. Those with a left way of thinking magnify contradictions between ourselves and the enemy to such an extent that they take certain contradictions among the people for contradictions with the enemy and regard as counter-revolutionary persons who are actually not counter-revolutionaries. Both these views are wrong. Neither can lead to the correct handling of the question of suppressing counter-revolutionaries or to a correct assessment of this work. I bid page 25. Qualitatively, different contradictions can only be resolved by qualitatively different methods. For instance, the contradiction between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie is resolved by the method of socialist revolution. The contradiction between the great masses of the people and the feudal system is resolved by the method of democratic revolution. The contradiction between the colonies and imperialism is resolved by the method of national revolutionary war. The contradiction between the working class and the peasant class in socialist society is resolved by the method of collectivization and mechanization in agriculture. Contradiction within the Communist Party is resolved by the method of criticism and self-criticism. The contradiction between society and nature is resolved by the method of developing the productive forces. The principle of using different methods to resolve different contradictions is one which Marxist-Leninists must strictly observe. Quote on Contradiction, in brackets, August 1937, Selected Works, Volume 1, pages 321 to 322. Since they are different in nature, the contradictions between ourselves and the enemy, and the contradictions among the people, must be resolved by different methods. To put it briefly, the former are a matter of drawing a clear distinction between ourselves and the enemy and the latter a matter of drawing a clear distinction between right and wrong. It is, of course, true that the distinction between ourselves and the enemy is also a matter of right and wrong. For example, the question of who is in the right, we or the domestic and foreign reactionaries, the imperialists, the feudalists and bureaucrat capitalists, is also a matter of right and wrong but it is in a different category from questions of right and wrong among the people. On the correct handling of contradictions among the people, in brackets February 27th, 1957, first pocket edition, pages 5 to 6. The only way to settle questions of an ideological nature or controversial issues among the people is by the democratic method. The method of discussion, of criticism, of persuasion, and education, and not by the method of coercion or repression. To be able to carry on their production and studies effectively, and to arrange their lives properly, the people want their government and those in charge of production and of cultural and educational organizations to issue appropriate orders of an obligatory nature. It is common sense that the maintenance of public order would be impossible without such administrative regulations. Administrative orders and the method of persuasion and education complement each other in resolving contradictions among the people. Even administrative regulations for the maintenance of public order must be accompanied by persuasion and education, for in many cases regulations alone will not work. I bid pages 11 to 12. 
Inevitably, the bourgeoisie and petty bourgeoisie will give expression to their own ideologies. Inevitably, they will stubbornly express themselves on political and ideological questions by every possible means. You cannot expect them to do otherwise. We should not use the method of suppression and prevent them from expressing themselves, but should allow them to do so and at the same time argue with them and direct appropriate criticism at them. We must undoubtedly criticize wrong ideas of every description. It certainly would not be right to refrain from criticism, look on while wrong ideas spread unchecked and allow them to monopolize the field. Mistakes must be criticized and poisonous weeds fought wherever they crop up. However, such criticism should not be dogmatic and the metaphysical method should not be used, but efforts should be made to apply the dialectical method. What is needed is scientific analysis and convincing argument. I bid pages 55 to 57. To criticize the people's shortcomings is necessary, but in doing so we must truly take the stand of the people and speak out of wholehearted eagerness to protect and educate them. To treat comrades like enemies is to go over to the stand of the enemy. Quote, talks at the Yenan Forum on Literature and Art, in brackets, May 1942. Selected Works, Volume 3, page 92. Contradiction and struggle are universal and absolute. But the methods of resolving contradictions, that is, the forms of struggle, differ according to the differences in the nature of the contradictions. Some contradictions are characterized by open antagonism, others are not. In accordance with the concrete development of things, some contradictions which were originally non-antagonistic develop into antagonistic ones, while others which were originally antagonistic develop into non-antagonistic ones. Quote on contradiction, in brackets August 1937, Selected Works, Volume 1, page 344. In ordinary circumstances, contradictions among the people are not antagonistic. But if they are not handled properly, or if we relax our vigilance and lower our guard, antagonism may arise. In a socialist country, a development of this kind is usually only a localized and temporary phenomenon. The reason is that the system of exploitation of man by man has been abolished and the interests of the people are basically the same. On the Correct Handling of Contradictions Among the People, February 27th, 1957, First Pocket Edition, at page 14. In our country, the contradiction between the working class and the national bourgeoisie belongs to the category of contradictions among the people. By and large, the class struggle between the two is a class struggle within the ranks of the people. By and large, the class struggle between the two is a class struggle within the ranks of the people because the Chinese national bourgeoisie has a dual character. In the period of the bourgeois democratic revolution, it had both a revolutionary and a conciliationist side to its character. In the period of the socialist revolution, exploitation of the working class for profit constitutes one side of the character of the national bourgeoisie, while its support of the constitution and its willingness to accept socialist transformation constitute the other. The national bourgeoisie differs from the imperialists, the landlords and the bureaucrat capitalists. The contradiction between the national bourgeoisie and the working class is one between the exploiter and the exploited, and is by nature antagonistic. But in the concrete conditions of China, this antagonistic class contradiction can, if properly handled, be transformed into a non-antagonistic one and be resolved by peaceful methods. However, it will change into a contradiction between ourselves and the enemy if we do not handle it properly and do not follow the policy of uniting with, criticizing and educating, the national bourgeoisie, or if the national bourgeoisie does not accept this policy of ours.
Ibid, pages 4 to 5. If the counter-revolutionary rebellion in Hungary in 1956 was a case of reactionaries inside a socialist country in league with the imperialists attempting to achieve their conspiratorial aims by taking advantage of contradictions among the people to foment dissension and stir up disorder, this lesson of the Hungarian events merits attention. Ibid, page 15. This has been the end of chapter 4 of Chairman Mao Zedong's Little Red Audio Book, The Correct Handling of Contradictions Among the People. Thank you for listening. Stay tuned for the final chapter. I bid you enjoy. Chapter 5 of The Little Red Book by Chairman Mao Zedong War and Peace War is the highest form of struggle for resolving contradictions. When they have developed to a certain stage between classes, nations, states, or political groups, and it has existed ever since the emergence of private property and of classes. Quote, Problems of Strategy in China's Revolutionary War in brackets, December 1936, Selected Works, Volume 1, page 180. Quote, war is the continuation of politics. In this sense, war is politics, and war itself is a political action. Since ancient times, there has never been a war that did not have a political character. But war has its own particular characteristics, and in this sense it cannot be equated with politics in general. Quote, war is the continuation of politics by other means. End quote. When politics develops to a certain stage beyond which it cannot proceed by the usual means, war breaks out to sweep the obstacles from the way. When the obstacle is removed and our political aim attained, the war will stop. But if the obstacle is not completely swept away, the war will have to continue till the aim is fully accomplished. It can therefore be said that politics is war without bloodshed, while war is politics with bloodshed. Quote, on protracted war, in brackets May 1938. Selected Works, Volume 2, pages 152-53 to 53. History shows that wars are divided into two kinds, just and unjust. All wars that are progressive are just, and all wars that impede progress are unjust. We communists oppose all unjust wars that impede progress, but we do not oppose progressive just wars. Not only do we communists not oppose just wars, we actively participate in them. As for unjust wars, World War I is an instance in which both sides fought for imperialist interests. Therefore, the communists of the whole world firmly opposed that war. The way to oppose a war of this kind is to do everything possible to prevent it before it breaks out and, once it does break out, to oppose war with war, to oppose unjust war with just war, whenever able. I bid, page 150. Revolutions and revolutionary wars are inevitable in class society, and without them it is impossible to accomplish any leap in social development and to overthrow the reactionary ruling classes, and therefore impossible for the people to win political power. Quote, on contradiction, in brackets, August 1937, Selected Works, Volume 1, page 344. Revolutionary war is an antitoxin which not only eliminates the enemy's poison but also purges us of our own filth. Every just revolutionary war is endowed with tremendous power and can transform many things or clear the way for their transformation. 
The Sino-Japanese War will transform both China and Japan, provided China perseveres in the War of Resistance, and in the United Front, the old Japan will surely be transformed into a new Japan, and the old China into a new China, and people and everything else in both China and Japan will be transformed during and after the war. Quote, on protracted war, in brackets May 1938. Selected Works, Volume 2, page 131. Every communist must grasp the truth. Quote, Political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. Quote, Problems of War and Strategy, in brackets November 6, 1938. Selected Works, Volume 2, page 224. The seizure of power by armed force, the settlement of the issue by war, is the central task and the highest form of revolution. The Marxist-Leninist principle of revolution holds good universally for China and for all other countries. I bid, page 219. Without armed struggle, neither the proletariat, nor the people, nor the Communist Party would have any standing at all in China, and it would be impossible for the revolution to triumph. In these years, in brackets, the 18 years since the founding of the party, the development, consolidation, and Bolshevization of our party have proceeded in the midst of revolutionary wars. Without armed struggle, the Communist Party would assuredly not be what it is today. Comrades throughout the party must never forget this experience for which we have paid in blood. Quote, Introducing the Communist in brackets, October 4th, 1939, Selected Works, Volume 2, page 292. According to the Marxist theory of the state, the army is the chief component of state power. Whoever wants to seize and retain state power must have a strong army. Some people ridicule us as advocates of the, quote, omnipotence of war. Yes, we are advocates of the omnipotence of revolutionary war. That is good, not bad. It is Marxist. The guns of the Russian Communist Party created socialism. We shall create a democratic republic. Experience in the class struggle in the area of imperialism teaches us that it is only by the power of the gun that the working class and the laboring masses can defeat the armed bourgeoisie and landlords. In this sense, we may say that only with guns can the whole world be transformed. Quote, Problems of War and Strategy, in brackets, November 6th, 1938. Selected Works, Volume 2, page 225. We are advocates of the abolition of war. We do not want war, but war can only be abolished through war, and in order to get rid of the gun, it is necessary to take up the gun. I bid. War, this monster of mutual slaughter among men, will be finally eliminated by the progress of human society, and in the not-too-distant future, too. But there is only one way to eliminate it, and that is to oppose war with war. To oppose counter-revolutionary war with revolutionary war. To oppose national counter-revolutionary war with national revolutionary war and to oppose counter-revolutionary class war with revolutionary class war. When human society advances to the point where classes and states are eliminated, there will be no more wars. Counter-revolutionary or revolutionary, unjust or just, that will be the era of perpetual peace for mankind. Our study of the laws of revolutionary war springs from the desire to eliminate all wars. Herein lies the distinction between us communists and all the exploiting classes. Quote, Problems of Strategy in China's Revolutionary War, in brackets, December 1936, Selected Works, Volume 1, pages 182 to 83. Our country and all the other socialist countries want peace. So do the peoples of all the countries of the world. The only ones who crave war, and do not want peace, are certain monopoly capitalist groups in a handful of imperialist countries which depend on aggression for their profits. 
quote, opening addressed at the 8th National Congress of the Communist Party of China, September 15th, 1956. To achieve a lasting world peace, we must further develop our friendship and cooperation with the fraternal countries in the socialist camp and strengthen our solidarity with all peace-loving countries. We must endeavour to establish normal diplomatic relations on the basis of mutual respect for territorial integrity and sovereignty and of equality and mutual benefit, with all countries willing to live together with us in peace. We must give active support to the national independence and liberation movement in countries in Asia, Africa and Latin America, as well as to the peace movement, and to just struggles in all the countries of the world. I bid. As for the imperialist countries, we should unite with their peoples and strive to coexist peacefully with those countries. Do business with them and prevent any possible war. But under no circumstances should we harbour any unrealistic notions about them. On the correct handling of contradictions among the people, February 27th, 1957, First Pocket Edition, page 75. We desire peace. However, if imperialism insists on fighting a war, we will have no alternative but to take the firm resolution to fight to the finish before going ahead with our construction. If you are afraid of war day in, day out, what will you do if war eventually comes? First, I said that the east wind is prevailing over the west. The wind and war will not break out. And now I have added these explanations about the situation in case war should break out. Both possibilities have thus been taken into account. Speech at the Moscow Meeting of Communist and Workers' Parties, in brackets November 18th, 1957, quoted in Statement by the Spokesman of the Chinese Government, in brackets September 1st, 1963. People all over the world are now discussing whether or not a third world war will break out. On this question, too, we must be mentally prepared and do some analysis. We stand firmly for peace and against war. But if the imperialists insist on unleashing another war, we should not be afraid of it. Our attitude on this question is the same as our attitude towards any disturbance. First, we are against it. Second, we are not afraid of it. The First World War was followed by the birth of the Soviet Union with a population of 200 million. The Second World War was followed by the emergence of the Socialist Camp with a combined population of 900 million. If the imperialists insist on launching a Third World War, it is certain that several hundred million more will turn to socialism and then there will not be much room left on earth for the imperialists. It is also likely that the whole structure of imperialism will utterly collapse. This has been the end of Chapter 5 of Chairman Mao Zedong's Little Red Audio Book, War and Peace. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you've all found it informative. Have a good one. Till next time.